Hello, my name is Samuel Weiskawi, and today I will present about the Charge Tape Lab. Here's a brief overview of today's presentation. To start, I will go into the experiment goals. One was to practice at home lab procedures, as this was the first lab of the semester. Another was to explore how various charged and neutral objects interact. And a third was to estimate some properties of a piece of charge tape. The results for the charge on a piece of charge tape and electron to atom ratio on said piece of tape are given as a preview. Some key concepts include the electric field from point charge, given here, electric force, given here, and static equilibrium, which uses Newton's second law, given here. These three will come together to form our model explained in detail shortly. Some observations include the fact that charged tapes repel one another, indicating they are of like charge, whether positive or negative that a piece of charge shape is attracted to neutral items, which makes sense, as positive and negative objects can form an attractive induced dipole in neutral objects, as shown here. And the charge tape was attracted to a negatively charged pen, indicating the tape had a positive charge, as opposite charges are attracted to one another. Some measurements taken are given here. Density was given, and using density and length, we found the mass. Width was also measured, as was the distance needed between an upper tape and lower tape to get the upper tape to float, which was done as shown here. This was measured twice with two pieces of tape of the same length to get higher accuracy with the average value given here. Uh, the first calculation of interest was the charge on one piece of tape, Q, which was found using a model of the two pieces of tape as point charges with the top piece of tape in static equilibrium. In static equilibrium, net force is zero, and the only two forces on said piece of tape are the gravitational force downwards and electric force upwards. Therefore, we can say those two forces were of equal magnitude. This will be used to find Q shortly. Uh, tape dimensions were also used to find the number of atoms on a piece of tape, and this was used to find the ratio of deficient electrons to atoms. Here are the equations for electric force, gravitational force. If you set these equal, you get this expression. You can move Coulomb's constant over, as well as r squared, and take the square root to get an expression for Q. Plugging in values gives you 1.84 times 10 to the negative 8 Coulombs for the charge on one piece of tape. Now to find the number of atoms present, I found the area of a piece of tape, like so, and then estimated the average area of an atom as the average length of an atom, one angstrom, squared, to get this value. Then I divided the total tape area by atomic area to get this value. To estimate the electron to atom ratio, we found the number of electrons by dividing total charge by the charge of one electron to get this value, and dividing number of electrons by number of atoms for this value. Now, code was also used to confirm the calculation of charge. Uh, this is a general overview of the code's format. Code no uh, notably assumed or took the tapes as point charges, as was done in the calculations by hand, and also assumed a uniform distribution of charge on the two pieces of tape that was equal to one another, i.e. Q, which was also done in the by hand calculations. And as you can see here, the charge calculated by program was the same as that found by hand. Some concluding questions. Would our observations have been different if electrons had positive charge and uh, protons had negative charge? No, because they would still be of opposite charges. So opposite charges would be attractive, like charges would be repulsive, and both could still form attractive dipoles in neutral objects. Why should we handle the tape from the edges? This is because as items come into contact, they transfer charge between one another, and by minimizing contact, we help maintain consistency of charge on the tape. Finally, any potential sources of error? Yes, the precision of a ruler is not particularly high, there was some difficulty of measuring the distance while holding the tape, 
and there was some subjectivity in judging when tapes started to float, all of which could have caused some errors. Thank you.